Good evening, everybody. I am Assemblymember Laura Friedman, representing the 43rd Assembly District, and I'm very, very happy that you've chosen to spend an hour with us tonight discussing a very, very important and very timely issue, which is gun safety and gun violence. Um, certainly, uh, people are very aware right now that we seem to have a, a growing problem with gun violence in America. It's something that most other nations are not experiencing the way we're experiencing here in the United States. It's something that I hear frequently from my constituents and I have to say from my own family. A few weeks ago, my daughter who just turned nine happened to hear a report about one of our many mass shootings in this nation on the radio and said to me from the back of the car while the radio was on, she said that she didn't feel safe, that she didn't feel safe in this world. And she has had to have drills at school about what to do when there's an active shooter. And she's nine years old. Uh, I think a lot of us who are parents feel that this is something that our children shouldn't have to be worried about. Um, more and more of us feel afraid to go to public places, to go to parades, to go to shopping malls, to go to movie theaters. And we feel that this isn't the America that we want. So we have a, put together a really wonderful panel tonight to talk about efforts that are ongoing right now at the local level, at the state level and at the national level to try to address this epidemic of gun violence. Now, it can seem very frustrating right now and I feel very frustrated by not just what's been happening in our streets but also by the recent Supreme Court uh, ruling that opens the door to pretty much everybody in the country being able to carry a gun, uh, a concealed weapon. Many of us feel that the continual arming of America with more and more guns um, in the hands of, of everybody um, makes many of us feel less safe and not more safe. And I, I will say that I am in that camp. Uh, I don't wanna think that every single person who's driving recklessly on the road or every person who's having a bad day and expressing themselves with anger in a crowded place, every person who might have just un undergone a traumatic life experience um, is also carrying a concealed weapon. To me, that's terrifying. And we've heard from people in Burbank that they're concerned by what seems like a proliferation of gun shops opening up in their community. And so we're gonna talk about all of this tonight. What actually does make us more safe? What makes us less safe? What can be done to keep guns out of the wrong hands? And is there any way of even doing that? Now, I wanna talk just for a few minutes about some data and about some efforts at the state level before I turn this over to my panel but I do wanna tell you a little bit about the panel that we're gonna be having and I'll let them introduce themselves if they like when they speak. Uh, this idea for this panel was brought to me by two local officials, by Dr. Emily Weisberg, who is a um, member of the Burbank Unified um, uh, School District uh, Board of Directors, um, by council member Nick Schultz, who is a council member here in Burbank, uh, asked if we could put this together because they have been getting so many questions from their constituents, from parents, from members of the community, and wanted to see if we could have an, a, a way of talking about what we're working on together collaboratively. And we've also been able to uh, bring in someone I'm very, very proud to have on the panel with us, and that's Tanya Shart, who's the Senior Counsel and Director of the State and Federal Policy for Brady United Against Gun Violence, which is one of the most prominent anti-gun violence and gun safety organizations in the United States. So I wanna welcome all of you and thank you so much for, for being with us tonight. So just a little bit of data uh, um, having to do with a bill that I've introduced a couple of years ago and because of COVID was held and which we have reintroduced this year and are moving forward to the legislature. I'm happy to say that Brady is one of the sponsors of this legislation and that it's had bipartisan and very wide support so far. I don't think it's had any no votes in the legislature and I'm looking for, it's, it's also part of what Governor Newsom is calling his gun safety package. So first of all, it's shocking to hear that 87% of children know where their parents' guns are kept and 60% of those have handled them. Now we have heard statistics that as many as, as, of, uh, as one out of four American families might be armed at this point um, and owning guns. And that's a tremendous amount of children who have handled their parents' guns and who know where their parents' guns are hidden. And new data released by the Centers for Disease Control show that firearms have now become the leading cause of death for children and teens in America. And that's new, that used to be traffic accidents, which by the way, fatal traffic accidents and, and, and um, severe traffic accidents have also gone up about 20% in the last couple of years in America. And yet gun violence still outpaces that horrible statistic. 
And every year, 18,000 children and teens are shot and killed or wounded, and approximately 3 million are exposed to gun violence. The bill that I've introduced, AB 452, ensures that students, parents, and guardians are aware of our state's safe storage laws when it comes to our legal requirement and moral requirement that if you have a gun and you have a child, you should have that gun securely locked away, not in a shoebox at the top of a closet, not in a drawer, but securely locked away from where any child can get it. And I guarantee you that just about every family that's had their child die from a self-inflicted gunshot wound, every family that's had a, a teen kill themselves, every family that's had a child accidentally shoot a sibling, and this happens almost every day in our nation, none of them ever dreamed that their child either knew where their gun was or that their child was mentally unstable. So you thinking that your child is mature enough to handle a firearm is not good enough. You need to stay, you need to lock that gun away and make sure that the child doesn't know where the keys are kept. So we have already passed a lot of bills in the state in the last couple of years to deal with growing gun violence. And this year is no exception. Uh, last year, we passed AB 2571, which prohibits firearm industry members from marketing or advertising firearm related products directly to minors because they actually do do that in many parts of this nation. This year, we have 13, SB 1327 by Bob Hertzberg, one of our Senate partners, which is modeled on the structure of Texas's current recent abortion ban and allows private citizens to sue anybody who manufactures, distributes, transports, imports, or sells assault weapons, or what are called ghost guns in California. And a ghost gun is a gun where the serial number has been um, removed, intentionally removed so that the gun is not traceable. AB 1621 would bar the sale and purchase of unserialized parts used to build these ghost guns, another huge problem where people are getting around our laws to require registration of firearms. AB 2551 requires the California Department of Justice upon notification that a specified prohibited person attempted to purchase a firearm to notify local authorities in the jurisdiction where that person resides. So in other words, if someone is a domestic violence abuser or has a restraining order, if somebody is a convicted felon, if someone for any reason is, is, is not allowed to legally own a gun, if they try to purchase one, local law enforcement must be notified because the next stop for that person might very well be to purchase one of those ghost guns. AB 1594 establishes the Firearm Industry Standard of Conduct, which places a series of requirements on industry members and prohibits them from dangerous practices. Now, going back to when I was a council member in Glendale, I was part of a three to two vote to ban the Glendale Gun Show from happening at the Glendale Civic Center. That was the longest running gun show and the last gun show, I believe, in Los Angeles County uh, to be held on public property. Now, you might argue whether or not that gun show posed a direct threat to the people of Glendale, but there were plenty of people that didn't want to see public property being used to promote the selling of deadly weapons. So it was a very controversial decision at the time, but I believe it was the right decision to make for the city. And since that happened, I have never heard anybody complain that they couldn't buy a, purchase a gun for one thing, but the people who um, send their kids to Glendale Community College or to Mountain View Elementary, which are right up the road, have told me that they're very happy to know that there aren't people who are heavily armed uh, coming and going from that gun show. So I just wanna quickly introduce our panelists. Uh, Emily Weisberg, Dr. Emily Weisberg has been working as a teacher, facilitator and curriculum designer for over 20 years on issues of equity, diversity and inclusion. And she currently teaches seventh and eighth grade history where she specializes in helping students understand history as a means of better understanding themselves. And she is currently our clerk um, uh, on the Burbank, Burbank Unified School District School Board and is a trustee Burbank's um, Board of Library Trustees. She is an elected school board member and I'd like to welcome her here this evening. Hello, Dr. Weisberg. I'll call you Emily. Uh, Nick you. Schultz has spent his entire professional career in public service where he's worked to protect the public from various threats. Nick currently serves in his day job as a deputy attorney general with the fraud and special prosecution section of the attorney general's office with the California Department of Justice. In this role, he works with state and federal law enforcement officials to investigate and prosecute criminal cases, primarily related to financial and corporate fraud, public corruption, and human trafficking. But you all know him better as a council member here in Burbank. Welcome, Nick. And Tanya Shark 
has over a decade of legal experience and a background in international and human rights law and gun violence prevention. Tanya brings a combination of civil litigation experience and a significant understanding of gun violence and its implications around the country. She began her career in civil practice and she also has a master's where she evaluated the legality of, second, of the Second Amendment under international human rights treaties and laws. So she's gonna bring, I believe, a wealth of knowledge to this panel about what the law actually says, and what the constitution actually requires. And she continued working for Amnesty International where she wrote a report entitled In the Line of Fire, Human Rights in the US Gun Violence Crisis. And now she's senior counsel at Brady and we are so thrilled to have her here to bring her um, incredible experience representing victims of gun violence, as well as her work assisting government and public officials in defense of reasonable gun laws. So with that, I'm going to move on now to questions. Now, for those of you who are uh, watching us, um, it is very, uh, if you um, have, if there's a chat in the format that you're watching, we do have staff that are monitoring chats. We have had um, questions sent to us for the last couple of weeks. And the questions that we're gonna be asking comes from, the, they come from the public, from questions that have been sent to us and asked to us. And if you send us questions, we will do our best if we have time to answer those. And if there's any questions that we don't get to this evening, we will try to get you an answer from whoever we think is best equipped to answer your question. And we will email that back to you. And we hope to do that within the next few weeks. So any questions that you send us through chat, we will, um, we'll, we're monitoring that. And if we can't answer them tonight, we will get you a question. So I'm gonna start first with Tanya, and that is what your thoughts are broadly on the recent legislation that was passed by Congress. Absolutely. First of all, I just wanted to thank you so much, Assemblymember, not only for hosting this event, which is incredibly informative. I think it's really great to have these conversations and to be communicating with um, your constituents and everybody so they understand kind of what's going on, given this is an overwhelming problem that I think all Americans and including all Californians are dealing with. So and also, I obviously want to thank you also for being such a leader in this space. We are so happy to be sponsoring AB 452 and to have worked with you on that and can't wait for it to get signed. Um, it's, you know, I think it's been a, a rough six weeks, um, since Buffalo, then Uvalde, and, and then certainly we had the Supreme Court decision and, um, what happened on July 4th, I think also really impacted everybody. I think there have been some bright lights and I think the federal bill is, is one of those. I think, you know, it, it is, I will say it is not a, the do all be all bill that we, I think we, we think will fix gun violence because I don't think there is one bill that will fix gun violence because gun violence is such a multifaceted issue. But this bill does include so many important pieces that will actually save lives, whether it's from enhanced background checks for those from the ages 18 to 20, or it's funding for, uh, for uh, extreme risk laws, which is so important, or partially closing the boyfriend loophole, which has been something we have been trying to do for so very long. Uh, the fact that we have a really comprehensive substantive piece of legislation, the first federal piece of legislation with regards to gun violence prevention that's been signed in almost 30 years is truly something to celebrate. Um, I say that again with the caveat there that there is more to do and that this isn't going to end gun violence in any way, like to the full extent, but we do feel confident that this will save lives. That's great. Thank you so much. And I do want to also acknowledge um, all of the participants, but particularly uh, it was brought to my attention that the mayor of Burbank, uh, Jess Helmandes, is watching as well as council member Bob Frutos. And I want to welcome both of them. And um, I, I'm looking forward to learning a lot from all the panelists. So I know that it's good to know that we're all here to learn and to, to listen. So is there anything, Tammy, that you think we all need to understand about the recent action in Congress? Are there any loopholes that you think the public should be aware of? And after that, maybe you can talk about what you think is next on the horizon at the federal level. What do you think is realistic in terms of, given our very partisan, very divided Congress, what do you think we should reasonably expect to happen? Absolutely. I don't know that I would identify any specific loopholes or failures of the bill per se. Um, I think it does many things. I think, um, you know, like I said, it partially closes the boyfriend loophole. I think we live, you know, you all live in California. I'm a Californian at heart. I'm not there right now, but you know, in California, it is completely closed. So I think there's that, but I think for, you know, as a whole, it does take that partial step in closing um, the boyfriend loophole to some extent. 
I think what is more important is that latter part of that question, which is, you know, what are we going to do next? I think it is imperative that we act upon the momentum of this moment and continue to push for more on a federal level. I, I can't promise that it'll happen, but I think it is really important that we do that. And I think that has to include universal background checks, comprehensive background checks. You know, again, there is no one policy that is going to really, you know, end gun violence, but background checks are really the framework for so many other gun violence prevention policies that we use. They, it is the way that we make sure that whoever is purchasing that firearm is legally permitted to purchase the firearm. And that is imperative. So we will continue to push for passage of 8R8, HR8. We will continue to push the Senate to take up the vote. Uh, I think it's a, we should force them to vote on this. It's a, m over 90% of Americans are supportive of comprehensive background checks for all gun sales. So we will continue to push that. I think the other policy that is on top of everybody's minds is an assault weapons ban as well. These are weapons of war. Of war. There is absolutely no need for people everyday people to have these on the streets of the US. You know, again, in California, these have already been banned, which is great, but it is, it is really important that we do this nationwide. These mass shootings, which, you know, almost always include the use of these assault weapons um, are indicative of the need to really ban these products. And so let me ask you, you know, one of the questions that we get a lot um, going back to sort of the gun show issue or the gun shop issue is what relation do policies actually have to making us safer um, in terms of what the root causes of gun violence are and how much do our policies um, or how reactive are they to what the research might or might not show about the root causes of gun violence. And certainly that's a big spectrum, right? There's a difference between somebody who uses a gun in a robbery versus someone who uses a gun in a domestic violence incident versus someone who uses a gun in a mass shooting incident with str against strangers. So how does whatever the research there may or may not be out there relate to our policies That's under our laws? It's a wonderful question. And the way that I always say it is like, gun violence is really an exacerbation of other types of violence, right? Like the categories that you just laid out. Um, and, and they have entirely different root causes. So I think it is very important that as a movement, we also focus on those root causes with, with community violence, for example. I think it's imperative that we look to prevent the demand for guns and really invest in communities and, and you know, try to prevent recidivism rates and things like that. So that's a root cause for community violence. You know, and I think each of these different types of gun violence from self-harm, hate crimes, domestic violence, community violence, um, to, I think all of those have different root causes. I think the thread that binds them is ac unfettered access to firearms. So I think in addition to dealing with these root causes, it, impar it is imperative that we make sure that we have a system of regulations to ensure that only those who should have access to firearms do have access to firearms. And that includes going all the way upstream to ensure that the industry itself is acting responsibly in its business practices to ensure that firearms are not sold to people, you know, that they're not targeting minors, for example, in their in their advertising, as we've seen minors to be a really risky age group, um, in particular with regards to mass shootings or self harm, that they're not selling to um, known traffickers, things like that. So I think, you know, there's a broad spectrum of what we need to do from the supply side all the way down to the root causes of all these different types of gun of violence. Great, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm going to move on. Uh, I think to our two elected officials. And before I do, I just wanna um, note that another school board member, Dr. Armand Agakhanian is also uh, watching tonight and participating. And we really appreciate having him here as well. So I'm gonna, um, I guess, maybe throw this over to, um, to, to Nick, to our Burbank council member. And the question is, do you think that COVID-19 and that crisis has impacted the climate around gun safety some people pointed out, you know, maybe it's anecdotal, but that during the early days of COVID when we were on lockdown, that there seemed to be a fear-based response to that lockdown or maybe to the, the shortages in the grocery stores of people going and buying firearms. You know, we heard stories of lines down the block, uh, you know, in front of some of the Burbank gun shops. Um, have you heard, have you experienced that? And what, what do you have any thoughts about that? And just as such in general, whether you feel that there's been any lasting impact around the culture of guns due to COVID. And I know you're not a, a psychiatrist, but just curious if you have any thoughts. Well, thank you very much, assembly member. Um, I'm really honored to be part of this panel. Uh, and I know that while I'm here tonight, I know that all of my colleagues on the Burbank City Council feel very passionately and strongly about this issue. So 
I just wanted to start off by saying I don't speak for the council or for any of my colleagues. I'm here tonight just to offer my two cents as a practitioner, as an attorney with experience in Second Amendment litigation. Um, what I, I guess what I would say, first of all, is I think what we have to acknowledge is that there's a lot of angst and anxiety in our society right now, not just related to COVID-19, but we've seen an uptick in crime across Los Angeles County and much of California. And so I think that people are very concerned. I do, I personally have seen, and I, I, I heard it from some of our residents here in Burbank, that you know folks are lining up and they have lined up outside of gun stores and they are concerned for their safety and they're concerned about crime rates. So I think that that drives to some extent the, uh, the desire, the access, uh, desire to access guns. Um, one thing that I would like to add on, if I might, assembly member, is something that, that Tanya was actually just talking about a minute ago, and that is the, the federal package. I, I, I have to be honest, I was pleasantly, pleasantly surprised to see Congress take action that President Biden can sign off on. I didn't think it would. Um, what I would add is that while it does a great many things and it's certainly progress, the, there are common sense reforms that I truly believe are bipartisan that were not included in that package that we really need to go back to the table on. Talking about truly universal background checks to keep weapons out of the hands of those who shouldn't have them in the first place, that's key and there's more work to do there. Bringing back the assault weapons ban, that is key. Look, uh, one of the things I hear from folks right here in Burbank is they say, look, you wanna talk about gun control, Nick, but someone who's experiencing a mental health crisis, it's not gonna stop them. You know, whether, you know, let's say you put a, a buffer zone in, we'll talk about that later with gun stores, they can still get access to a gun. One thing I always like to respond with is, we have to look at how do you minimize the damage that somebody can do? You know, firing a pistol or a handgun is one thing. Having an automatic weapon, you know, that weapons of war have no place on our streets. And again, that's just one council member's opinion. And carrying out the work that you've been doing assembly member you know, for the last few years, emphasizing safe storage. The point I'm trying, the picture I'm trying to paint here is I think there's a lot of angst and concern in the community. A lot of it comes from the fact that we fall into talking points rather than really having detailed discussions like we are tonight about what the problem is and what are the right policy solutions and what are the wrong ones? What shouldn't we consider? But I think that if we educate, talk about it publicly and we bring everybody to the table and we send a clear message and that is we want to promote responsible gun ownership. If you register your firearm, if you take classes, if you safely store it, you're exactly the kind of person we're talking about when we say the Second Amendment does allow you to have a firearm and we want you to exercise that right intelligently and responsibly and safely. So I guess that, that's the message I hope we get across tonight. It's about implementing common sense, bipartisan efforts to protect our community because that's what's really driving this discussion. Absolutely. Thank you. And I think putting those parameters are really important because, uh, you know, I, I, we do recognize, I think everybody on this panel, that, there, that the Second Amendment exists and we're not talking about um, uh, doing away with it or taking away people's right to have a gun. The question is, is that right completely unlimited? And what's considered, you know, a, a gun? What's considered a firearm? What was considered a firearm back when the Constitution was written was very, very different than what is considered a, a firearm now or, or, or arms. And the, the Constitution and the framers of the Constitution couldn't have imagined the kind of carnage that modern weapons uh, are capable of. And, you know, arms can be very liberally described, right? Is a, uh, you know, is a cannon an arm, is a, is, you know, is a bazooka an arm? You know, I think that every, most people would agree that there needs to be a reasonable limitation and the assault wipe, um, weapon ban didn't stop people from owning guns, uh, but it's certainly those, those same weapons have caused a lot of carnage on our streets. So I wanna to turn to Emily because one of the most tragic and perverse part of gun violence is that some of these mass shooters seem to be targeting the most innocent among us, which are children and school shootings uh, the fact that there is, is even such a thing as school shootings in this country is such an abomination. Uh, and so as a parent, I, I want to ask the question that a lot of parents are asking, what can we do to keep our children safe without turning our schools into prisons or fortresses? Uh, how do we find that balance? And what are you talking about right now? What are you and your colleagues talking about on the Burbank School Board? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the question, right? So I'm grateful to see my colleague, Dr. Agakani in here. I know we've had many conversations about this and also our partners, uh, Mayor Talamantes and Council Member Frutos and Council Member Schultz. But I think it's, it, it, it's hard to know 
exactly where to go because so much of what we're going to need to, to keep our schools safer are sensible gun control laws. Um, that's a huge part of it. One of the things that we know has happened, especially during COVID, is a huge uptick in mental health issues. So we're seeing not only you know people sort of motivated by fear to create those lines at the gun stores in Burbank, but also our students really struggling with depression and suicidal ideation and any number of other things that drives them also often to feel like they have no recourse other than to pick up a weapon and and do something with it. So I think part of it is about understanding that we need to be supporting our students and our teachers as they struggle to feel safe, much like you, you mentioned your daughter, um, that they can go to school and feel safe and feel secure. Um, we work a great deal with our with the Burbank police to provide training to our teachers to make sure that they're prepared in case of an incident like this. I, th I think one of the things, and this is sort of a backwards way of answering your questions, but, but one of the things I think we, we do need to do is resist the urge to make sort of fear-based decisions in regards to how we do keep our schools safe. So if you look at the data, having students participate in active shooter training is extremely detrimental to their mental health and their well-being. We know that based on enormous amounts of research and data. We also know that placing armed police in schools has also not been an effective deterrent. And again, this isn't a statement that is anti-police, but I think you know Uvalde is an example of what happens when police are dealing with someone who has a semi-automatic weapon and, and they are not capable, they're not armed in the same way. So I mean, in, in post Parkland, Florida placed police in every single school, elementary through high school. And what we ended up seeing in that case is that youth arrests had exploded by 20%, a, a student being expelled 43%. There were more police officers in schools than school nurses and mental health officials. Um, and there were four times as many incidents of physical restraints on students. So I think part of the response that we're thinking about on the school board is how do we respond in a way that helps our students feel safe and doesn't in fact create more of a culture of fear um, especially with our students of color. So it's, it's really, really difficult. And I do think this conversation around legislation has never been more important as far as things like ghost guns or talking about where a gun store can be in relationship to a school. So I think for us, the approach is, is focused more on the issue of mental health and how to create a safe space for our students on campus and our teachers and our staff without, like I said, making sort of fear-based decisions or, or thinking the answer is to, to what you said, assembly member, to sort of create a more, an almost prison-like feel for our schools and our students. Because we know, and again, ba truly based on data and research, that does not, does not help. So let me ask, um, I, I guess all of you or whoever wants to answer, when, when I hear phrases like keeping guns out of the wrong hands. And there are people who seem to clearly fit that bill, at least in my mind, you know, people who have act, active domestic violence cases where there's restraining orders, um, people who have committed certain violent crimes perhaps. But it seems like a lot of the shooters that commit some of the worst atrocities are not people that have something that would show up on a criminal background check. You know, in hindsight, people say, yeah, there were warning signs, but we've all had people around us that we thought were a little creepy, right? So how do you turn somebody being angry, how do, how do you identify the person who really is going to pose a threat? Um, you know, there, there are people that get, that they'll go into someone's home and have 50, 60 guns. You know, is there anything under the law that, that limits the number of guns that someone can have? And, and are there, is there any thought about how you start to identify people who would pass a background check, but who might be posing some of the highest risk? And maybe this is a question for Tanya, um, because I know that this has gotta be a, a, a common question that you get. Yeah, and I think it's complicated. I certainly think um, it, in particular in the context of mass shootings, I don't, there was that New York Times cover that showed that he purchased the gun legally in all of these mass shootings. I think part of that is a problem because our laws are not as comprehensive as they should be to cover categories of people who shouldn't have access to certain weapons. Quite often that's an age restriction, right? Again, why are we allowing 18 year olds to 
not purchase handguns, but they are permitted to purchase assault weapons. I think that's one thing. Um, with regards to like doing a more comprehensive check to determine if somebody should have access to a gun, you know, certainly we have the standard uh, prohibitions under both federal and state law that are checked when you get a, a you know a, a background check when you purchase a firearm from a federally licensed firearms dealer. Um, some states have also built in uh, additional protections as part of licensing purchase to permits. Uh, we think those are really really key because it does allow the state to do kind of a little bit further of an investigation to determine to make that the person purchasing the firearm is not at heightened risk of harming themselves or others. So I think a any state licensing system for purchasing a firearm or possessing a firearm is a really key element um, of kind of a firearm, a system of firearm regulation. Thank you. I'm gonna move now to questions that we've gotten from the public and are getting right now from the public. So first, somebody um, has written and asked about the legality of regulating um, ammunition. And is that a way, maybe if you wanted to get around the Second Amendment, is that a way to get around the Second Amendment? And is that something that anybody's talked about or looking at? So ammunition is actually regulated under federal law. It is unlawful for somebody who is prohibited under federal law to purchase a firearm to actually purchase ammunition. Um, there just isn't a background check system. So there are bills um, including a federal bill that would require a background check. I think it's called Jamie's Law um, after Jamie Guttenberg, who was killed in Parkland. Um, her, it's, you know, a bill would require a background check for ammunition. California obviously requires a background check for ammunition. Other states have recently passed laws to require background checks and or record keeping for ammunition because you have seen a pattern of behavior, especially again, in particular with regards to mass shootings where the shooters purchase enormous amounts of ammunition and it should have been in indicative of um, high risk that they might carry out a mass shooting event. Great. Um, another question maybe for you, Tanya, is whether there's a way to address the loophole in the California gun-free school zone that allows gun retailers to operate in a school zone? And is it possible to expand the bill about marketing to prevent advertising and signage within a school zone as well? I'm not sure if you're the right person for this, but I'll, I'll ask. I don't actually, I'm not that familiar with that law. I'm happy to take a look at it. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if Emily is more familiar simply because we're talking about schools, but I'm happy to take a look. Otherwise, Nick may also may, may know. Yeah, I, if it's all right, I remember, right? I yes, actually, please, of course. So the California law is a mirror image, if you will, of the federal gun school, gun free school zones act. And most of you probably know that you know you're, you're not allowed to you know carry possess a firearm within a thousand square feet of the school. But there are, like any law, carve outs and exceptions to that law. And one of the exceptions is those who are selling guns. So retailers, you know, they're, it, same would be if you have a gun in your home and you so happen to live within a thousand square feet of schools. So I, I think part of the question would be, is there some legislative response at the federal or state level? I, I would suggest that there is. On the local level, there are things that we can do. One of the strongest tools that local governments have is land use planning and zoning. We can talk more about that later. Um, but I think that maybe that's what the question is going to is, could there be a legislative fix on the, on the federal or state level? And I'll say I'm happy to take a look at that as well. So Tanya, you and I can maybe coordinate later and see if we do need to fix it. Um, Nick, I, I'll ask you um, a question that has come in, whether, what the city is looking at right now. And do you believe that having that, that, sure. that, that Burbank has too many gun shops? And if so, what would you do about it? Yeah, so one of the questions, um, just piggybacking off of that assembly member that I get is why do we have 14 gun stores in the city of Burbank? Um, a lot of the concern and the questioning really stemmed from the recent move of Gun World to their new location on Magnolia. Um, what people should know about Burbank land use and zoning is that if you're moving into a retail commercial space, uh, there's a buy right process in which you can open a retail establishment, including a gun store. A conditional use permit isn't generally required. So what that means is the planning board, the city council don't need to sign off on approving the gun store to go into that location. Under our code, it's, a, it's by right, they get to do it. Now, we do have a permitting process. So we have, they have, to, we have to, our police chief and our city staff have to make sure that they have gotten all the proper licenses and permits and you know, they're reputable and they're able to operate. Um, so that's why we're in this you know, predicament that we are today. All of these stores are here by right. Now, as far as what the city council is looking at, um, here's what I think the public should know. So earlier this year, we had an initial staff report at the request of an agenda item from our vice mayor 
uh, who wanted to talk about gun stores, uh, the process for licensing and permitting them. From that conversation, the council unanimously at that meeting decided that we wanted to study the issue further and other regulatory frameworks that we could look at. So again, I offer this just as one person's opinion and not speaking for my colleagues. But the way I look at it, there's a few different tools that local governments like Burbank have. One uh, would be land use and, and zoning. So we could be talking about a, a cap on the number of gun store permits that are allowed to issue in the city of Burbank. Uh, going back to what I was talking about a moment ago, uh, noticing that there is a, a, a serious, in my view, loophole in state and federal law in the Gun-Free School Zone Act. Um, we could look at buffer zones. Um, that's been done in places like Alameda County in California. Um, what it would look like potentially is within a certain number of feet of school zones and other sensitive areas. So think of like parks and playgrounds, gun stores wouldn't be allowed to operate within say 500 feet or what, whatever the council feels that it can justify based on the data. And just as a quick aside assembly member, the one thing that I think the public really should know is that we want to have a surgeon's precision in finding a response. And what that means is not acting in knee-jerk reaction, but really using data-driven policies to make decisions that keep our community safe and truly solve the issue at hand, rather than just looking like we're doing something. And that is why the council has been in lockstep and committed with working together to get solutions that make sense. Outside of land use and zoning, you could also have uh, uh, stepped up local inspections. So gun stores, gun retailers are inspected by either the uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, that's the federal agency, or the California Department of Justice. We actually have a Bureau of Firearms that not only inspects uh, gun retailers, we actually also confiscate guns from those who shouldn't have them. So convicted felons and our office prosecutes that as well. Although I will tell you, the volume of those cases far exceeds the amount of attorneys and agents that are able to investigate and work them up. So we do what we can, but it's in many times sort of like uh, trying to empty a boat of water that you're taking on through several hole, uh, holes in the, in the floor of that boat. Um, but one thing that communities have looked at doing is maybe hiring a retired annuitant, someone who worked at ATF or Cal DOJ, to do those inspections more frequently locally. And again, it's not to punish the gun stores, it's to make sure that they're aware of any deficiencies in their processes and complying with every aspect of state and federal law. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've heard from community members, a lot of questions have been, could there be, uh, you know, additional taxes or fees imposed to offset, um, you know, maybe school safety or to fund victims of gun violence prevention? These are all very broad categories of things that the council could look at. The thing I would encourage all of you who are watching tonight who care passionately about this issue, whatever side you're on, is to tune into our meeting on July 26th. Actually, I should take a step back. We're going to have a joint meeting with the school board on July 19th. So we're going to be talking more focused in that conversation about school safety and how to protect our kids, um, how BPD, for example, might be able to respond. Heaven forbid there was ever an active shooter incident in Burbank. Um, and then on the 26th, the staff is coming back with a report to talk about uh, issues related to our gun stores, to present options for the council to consider as the policymakers. And that'll be a really good opportunity from you, for all of you to hear, not just from me, but from all five of Burbank selected council members and really see where there is consensus to build. You know, while, while we're uh, talking to you, Nick, one of the questions was about the police response, you know, the criticisms of the police response in Uvalde um, coming to light and whether Burbank is now looking at whether they need to evaluate the training of Burbank's police officers and even the equipment to make sure that they are prepared to deal with if you know, the unthinkable happens and we have a terrible tragedy, if our police are ready uh, and trained for responding at a school or responding in a public place. I can tell you assembly member that our chief of police Mike Albanese is an exceptional officer who has cared very deeply about this issue and he spent a lot of time talking about it uh, since Uvalde and many prior tragedies. Um, I know that the police department feels very confident in the protocols that they have in place. I can also share with you that I believe at the uh, Burbank Police Commission's next meeting on July 20th, they're going to be talking specifically about school safety including, you know, uh, uh, responses to an active shooter situation, as well as uh, traffic safety around schools. But I can tell you that the police department is always looking at creative ways to make sure that they have the best tools, the best training. And speaking again for myself, I feel very confident, not only in our chief of police, but in our department to keep our community safe. Burbank's always been known as a very safe town. 
We have exceptional officers who put their lives on the line every day to keep us safe. And we are committed to making sure that when kids go to school, when our children, our grandchildren, our nieces and nephews go to school, they can come home safely. So can teachers and staff. That is, that is mission number one on the local level, right? Our job above all else is to keep people safe and we're committed to doing that. Thanks. And I'll also um, want to acknowledge that we've had several questions that come in or not questions, but just people um, uh, making the point that one of the reasons that people perhaps are buying so many guns right now is a general feeling of not feeling safe in their communities. You know, whether it's from because of a, the rise in crime, which which is real and the rise in violent crime, or whether it's because of, you know, they're reading about mass shootings and they feel that they need to be able to defend themselves if, if they hear of something in their own area. So I'm wondering, maybe Tanya can speak to the connection between personal safety and uh, owning a gun and what this, if there are any statistics about the, whether communities where a lot of people own guns tend to have less crime or are safer than communities maybe that have less guns in them. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a couple different things there. Um, first, I will say this, this, I do think that the gun industry really does, you know, create this rhetoric around fear to, 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 to increase gun sales, because the reality is that owning a gun actually makes you far more likely to be injured or harmed by gun violence. It is very rare that firearms are used for self-defense. Um, it is more often that you will, again, will be harmed by your own gun. There are very specific stats in particular regarding, you know, women self-harm. Um, so it is, I think it's, it's a, it's a little bit of a miscarriage. It's very much a mischaracterization. In fact, we call it the big lie that the gun industry is telling you that you will be safer if you have a firearm. The reality data shows that you will be less safe if you own a gun. Um, that's not to say that you can't responsibly own a gun. You, act, you absolutely can. It's just, it's important that those who, people who do purchase and who do possess firearms are aware of the risks associated with firearm ownership. Um, so I think that's, it's a really important fact to consider. I think it's, it's also really good to, to, investigate and to understand what gun ownership really means um, in terms of the, the impact on violence. I'll ask Emily, uh, I'm sure that you're hearing a lot from parents around their concerns um, uh, just about sending their kids to school and knowing that they're gonna be safe. Are you also hearing from parents about desire to change laws or to change policies? Uh, I, I'm curious whether, you know, what you're hearing if there's any commonalities, I'm sure you're getting a lot of different kind of input from lots of people, just like we are here on the chat. Uh, but are there any common threads that you're hearing right now from, from the, let's say from the moms, the moms and the dads out there? Yes. Short answer, yes. Long answer is, I mean, your own bill, AB 452, that requires school districts to send home information about safe storage for guns. Like that's a huge deal. And that's something that a lot of parents in Burbank push for for a very long time. So that, that, that was a huge deal for uh, Burbank Unified Parents. And I can see just from the, the attendee list, there are a lot of Burbank Unified Parents in uh, attending, which is fantastic to see. So I think that that is something that's been on a lot of people's minds. I think there is very real concern about guns, the proximity of gun stores to schools and what that means in regards to somebody purchasing a gun and then leaving the gun store and being close to any number of schools. Um, I shared a link uh, with some of your staff that has a really interesting layout of all of the gun stores in Burbank in relationship to all of our school sites, um, which is helpful and a little alarming. So I think that's, that's a big part of it, um, that, that parents are wondering how in Burbank we can create these sort of buffer barrier zones that the council member was speaking about. And I think the other thing that's come up quite a bit from parents, just to go back again, is this issue of mental health support. How are we supporting our students and our teachers and making them feel safe, making them feel secure, creating an opportunity if they do hear of a threat on social media, how are they able to report that threat? How does the district respond to that? Um, you know, and to echo the council member, I had a wonderful meeting with Chief Albanese, our Burbank Chief of Police, uh, about a week and a half ago, and really expressed some concerns to him. And they um, they have been for a very long time working with the district to provide training to our teachers and to provide support. Some of it they can share openly, some of it they can't for obvious reasons. But um, you know, our, our Burbank Police have a under three minute response time 
So in, in lots of ways, we're very, very lucky in Burbank to have the kind of police force that we do. We're very blessed that our chief is open and available to engage in conversations of, about this. But I, I think the sort of general bucket items, again, the safe storage information was big, um, figuring out these buffer zones so that the, the gun stores aren't in close proximity and that we're making sure that parents and students and staff have support to deal with the very real, the very, very real fear that comes from these numerous shootings. I told this uh, story to the chief that at my school, which is not in Burbank, um, I teach on the second floor and my, my classroom has windows on both sides. And uh, when we were still in session towards the end of the year, my students came to me and said, do you think I could survive jumping out of this second floor window? Do you think I could survive this? And I don't know how, as an educator, how to even answer that question. And they asked that I close the blinds on both sides because they didn't want anybody to be able to see in. So as an educator, especially post COVID, as you're working through all of the mental and emotional challenges of students coming back into the space, which I'm sure you deal with a lot with your daughter, um, it's difficult not to have answers. Um, and it's also difficult not to come from a place of emotion or fear in how you respond to those things. So I think, um, right. I know that the district is looking into more mental health support and we're working hand in hand with the city and the police to figure out ways to, um, like I said, create these barrier zones, these buffer zones so that there's some distance between the school and these weapons. So let me ask, you know, uh, uh, mental health has certainly been a big focus and it's been something that people who are responsible gun owners have, you know, often suggested as being the, the correct response rather than cracking down on gun ownership. So given that mental health certainly plays a big part of why we're having, um, you know, these atrocities happen, how, and I'm, I don't know who I'm asking, maybe Tanya, you know, what your suggestion would be for, for educators like Emily and school board members, for instance, how can they craft a way for students to understand what it what a risky individual looks like or, or behavior that should be a warning? Or maybe it's not the students. I would think that it's actually more, it's maybe a combination of students and teachers. But how do you make people understand how to recognize behavior that should send up a red flag? How do you, you know, how do you teach teachers what to do? And then how do you respond in a way that is respectful of people's rights, quite honestly, um, but also offering the kind of intervention and help that might prevent a tragedy. You know, I guess looking at that some of the young people in particular who have committed school shootings, I'm talking to people who are high school or you know, right out of high school, where in hindsight, people felt that there were signs that should have been recognized. How do we come up with a policy that, that systematically recognizes those warnings and then takes an action that is within people's rights, but offering the kind of intervention that might save lives. Is there any model out there that gives us a good example of how to do that? Sure, absolutely. I think first I'd wanna say that this isn't, we use the term mental health to kind of encompass this. I think in, in truth, ment people who suffer from mental health are far more likely to be victims of gun violence than to actually perpetrate gun, gun violence. So I think rather we should be looking at like violent tendencies or increased risk of harm to themselves or others for the, and I think it's important to frame it that way. And I think California has an incredible extreme risk law. You know, it was really the, you know, it was not the first, but we, you know, I think it was the first of its kind following the Isla Vista shooting, RGVR or o system is intended to provide this this exact thing right when there are in it, there is an indicia of a heightened risk of harm and of danger dangerousness or violence you know law enforcement you know and others can go and petition to have firearms removed from certain individuals so i think that should be the basis for anything that we do i think it, we certainly need to continue to um, invest in our GVRO system to properly implement it and make sure it's utilized in all the ways that it should be utilized because it's, I think it's a really important tool. And I think in so many of these mass shooting events, if there was access to it, or if somebody had pursued a GVRO or, you know, extreme risk or red, red flag law, whatever it's called in the different state, that these tragedies could have been prevented. Yeah, Emily, um, as a school board member, are you looking at ways of identifying 
And, and I totally agree. Some of some people you might look at and, and say, yes, they're mentally ill. I mean, we we saw a mass shooting several years ago in a movie theater where it seemed pretty clear, at least to me as a lay person, that the person was severely mentally ill. But in others, they're just hateful people who want to kill people. I don't right. want to give them a pass by saying that they are mentally ill. So um, and there must be a difference, right? Somebody who's under uh, the care of a mental health provider who feels that that person presents a threat they have recourse now under California law, I believe, in a way to go to authorities. The person is just a hateful individual, uh, you know, for whatever reason, who's uh, acting on an, uh, uh, an impulse just to commit violence because they hate Jewish people or they, you know, they hate someone of a different political, you know, persuasion. That's another story. Um, so I, I do think that this is easier, maybe easier to conceptually than to actually enact, right? Yeah. But in terms of the school setting, um, Emily, do you have any, are, are you trying to, are, is the Burbank school system trying to do any work in this area? Uh, yes. I mean, I think that the work really is focused more on if you see a threat, how to report it. And, you know, the, the district has set up an anonymous tip line that you can call because we know that often students are afraid to snitch on somebody. So providing them an anonymous opportunity to do that is wonderful. And we have a very clear action plan in place for when there is a reported threat. Um, we respond very quickly in, in uh, concert with our police department um, in order to do that. That's one way. And I, and I think the other issue is, is a more complex issue, which is um, the sort of racial component of when we label someone as struggling with mental health and when we don't. And we, we often see in cases with um, recent mass shootings, whether it's Highland Park or something else, when they tend to be sort of young white males, that it's a mental health issue. And so I don't know that it's, I think when we're looking for quote unquote sort of warning signs, it's more about students who say something that um, either speaks to self-harm or harm of others or makes a social media post that it, whether it's joking or not, that there's a zero tolerance for that, that there's a response. But I do also think it's important to recognize when we talk about mental health, our focus is really on the students, teachers and staff who are dealing with the anxiety and fear that comes with it and less about, you know, there are plenty of people, as you pointed out, who struggle deeply with mental health issues that will never pick up a gun and never do anything like what we've seen, you know, 200 plus times over the past year. So I think sometimes we get into, a, a dangerous place when we talk about it being specifically a mental health issue. And so I, I think we on the school board and in the district prefer more to talk about how we're providing that kind of mental health support, trauma-based mental health support. We've certainly invested um, a lot more of the, you know, we got one-time COVID money and we used that also to provide more mental health support in school. So it's as I think you, you know, so aptly stated, the, the mental health component is super, super complex. Um, but we are trying to continue both with parents and students to be very clear in letting people know, here is the way that you can respond. Here's the phone number. Here's the anonymous tip line. There are myriad ways that you can, you can report something. Um, anonymously or otherwise, and that we, you know, whether it's the mental health team met who comes out from Burbank and works with the students, or if it's one of our um, police officers who also come and connect, that there are ways to let people know that, uh, that there's something of concern. Nahania, um, a question has come in about the Supreme Court's recent decision and whether that is going to, how that would impact California's laws. Absolutely. Yeah. The Bruin decision came in about a week and a half ago and, um, you know, we were <laughs> anticipating it. I, it. I will say in some ways it wasn't quite as bad as we had thought in other ways. I think, you know, it's troubling and concerning with regards to the concealed carry law, which is directly implicated because we do have a similar proper or good cause standard, um, as is the case in the New York law. I do think that it, it functionally does render that moot. However, the rest of the licensing system with regards to concealed carry is maintained. Um, and I think that the there is already a bill to kind of make that even more robust to make sure that anybody who wants to carry a firearm in public, a concealed firearm in public has to go through several steps to make sure that they are um, 
suitable to be able to do that. I think that the law also expands sensitive place restrictions, um, knowing that we're going to have more people carrying concealed firearms, making sure that there are certain areas, you know, people or places where people are drinking, places where children are going to be, places where people are engaging in democratic processes like voting, things like that, making sure that these places are insulated from people carrying concealed weapons. Um, so I think, you know, it did again, impact this one narrow part of this licensing law, but I think so what, from what I can tell, the reaction is to actually make the system more robust. And I actually think the Supreme Court decision, you know, okays that because they actually um, refer to some other states that have these robust systems and they okay that functionally. Um, with regards to more broadly, its impact on uh, California's other laws, we know California has some of the strongest gun laws in the country. We know that they work. Gun violence in California is substantially low than the rest of the country, substantially lower than the rest of the country. We want to make sure that these laws are maintained. Um, you know, it is a little concerning because there is going to be a new test that courts will use when evaluating these laws. And it's a little bit different than anything we've seen in any other context. So the answer is we just don't know. You know, I think that we will continue to push for and move forward on policies that are data driven that will save lives. Um, and then I imagine the litigators, the AG's offices, they will continue to defend these laws and we will have to see, you know, where the cases land. But our, our hope is that um, we will continue to be able to pursue gun violence policy, gun violence prevention policies. And then I, if Tanya and maybe Nick as well, is there a place for cities to do their own kinds of regulations? Where, where should they be looking to do their own laws and rules and ordinances? And where should they really be for just for whatever reason, clarity's reason or legal reasons be deferring to the state or the federal government? I'm happy to jump in real quick and then pass it to Nick because I think he yeah. can actually talk about it in press. And someone had actually asked whether, whether for instance, Burbank could ban assault rifles even though maybe the, they're allowed other places. I think California bans them, but you know, what, what can cities do and what can't they? Absolutely. So, you know, California provides the localities to engage in ensuring that their constituents are safe because there is no strong preemption law that precludes them from passing laws with regards to, to guns. Having said that, that means that if, if the state has passed a law that's comprehensive and, and it applies statewide, um, that will be deemed to have been dealt with by the state in its entirety and localities probably won't be able to pass that. Um, it, it, it kind of is a case by case basis. But what I think is really important is that it is imperative that localities have the ability to fill gaps where states have not taken action. You know, I'm so glad again that California doesn't restrict localities ability to do this because every locality is different. You know, gun violence looks very different in San Jose, you know, than it does in Bakersfield, right? Like, I think like we have to be cognizant of the fact that the way that gun violence is impacting constituents differs from community to community and com localities, city councils, county councils, they need to be able to react to protect their constituents. So again, I think California gives broad discretion to localities to do that where look, California as a state already hasn't taken action. With regards to assault weapons, California has a really comprehensive law there. So this isn't really something or a place where I think the locality could take action. I will send it over to Nick. He may have a different opinion and let him kind of expand on, on everything they're, they're wanting to do. No, no, th thank you very much, Tanya. And I, and I think you hit it right on the nose. Um, you know, there is a hierarchy to all of this. To the extent that there are interstate commerce components, Congress is going to be the final arbiter of those regulations. There's a lot of great things that the state of California is doing, has done, and, and will continue to do under leadership, uh, the likes of which include you, Assembly Member. I think that the city of Burbank is entering into something that has been uh, relatively uncharted territory for us. But, you know, in the past, local governments haven't really weighed in significantly, at least not around these parts, uh, in, in gun regulation, because it's always been considered a state issue and a federal issue. And as we see tragedy after tragedy and young lives lost over and over, and yet seemingly endless uh, uh, inaction on the federal level, people are growing tired. And I think that you know, if there's any silver lining in any of it, it's that there is an invitation here for local governments to step up and to lead. You know, uh, one of the, a very famous Supreme Court justice once called the states, the laboratories of democracy in our republic. The state governments could really do things that maybe hadn't been tested yet on the national stage. I view Burbank and cities of our size very much like that. We are the incubators, the laboratories of 
democracy here in California. There's a lot of excellent legislation coming out of Sacramento, but there's, uh, there are gaps in places where we can act. Land use and saying, look, does a gun store belong next to a school? No, that's the kind of action that we can take locally. Making sure that our stores are inspected more frequently than the already stretched thin resources of the state government, that's another area we can take action. Uh, education, you know, and working collaboratively with our school, school board partners to make sure that people understand the laws, they understand the resources, both mental health and safe storage and other ones. These are the kinds of things that we can do. And I would say to anyone who cares about the world that we're leaving our children and our grandchildren, they're inheriting a mess. I went to school and I grew up in an age of Columbine and Thurston. And I was one of those students, like you described, assembly member, who had to go through an active shooter training. I have a one-year-old and I do not want her to be in a world where she has to do that to feel safe to go to school. Uh, that should not be acceptable to anybody. So I think the takeaway, at least for myself tonight, is that local governments can't sit idly by and say it's not our problem anymore. We have a responsibility to step up and act and speaking for my, myself, I intend to do that for my daughter and for all the kids here in Burbank. And look, this is an open conversation. I wanna hear from you. There are people tonight probably listening in who don't agree with me. I'm talking to you too. If you have a better idea for how we can protect our kids in our community, my invitation to you is to reach out. I want to hear from you. The only thing that I don't think any of us can accept and hopefully one thing we can all agree on is that we have a gun violence problem in this country and the status quo isn't working. So the question is, what are we going to do about it? And I commit to you, I'm gonna show up at council on July 26th, as I know my colleagues will, with ideas and thoughts, and I look forward to getting something done. Hopefully that, in partnership with the exceptional leadership we're seeing in Sacramento from you, assembly member, and some surprisingly forward-moving news out of, uh, out of DC. Hopefully these things working together will make our community safer. The last thing I'll add, is that much like homelessness and lack of affordable housing and crime and all these things are ongoing issues that our city needs to address, so is gun violence. We can't treat it like a one-time fix-all solution. It's a solution, it's an issue that we constantly need to be studying and adjusting to and problem solving for, and I look forward to doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And as we're hitting the hour mark, I'm gonna take that as your closing uh, comments in this town hall. And I'll move to uh, Dr. Weisberg to see if you would like to, um, you know, say anything you haven't said yet, or uh, just to, to, you know, give us your closing thoughts. Um, no, I just want to sort of echo what council member said that um, I encourage people to reach out to me. I saw in some of the Q and A question about mental health supports and other things specific to Burbank Unified. Um, happy to put my email in the chat. You can always reach out to me and encourage people to attend the July 19th joint meeting where this will be a huge um, component of the conversation. But I, again, just wanna reiterate that this is not something uh, that any of the board takes lightly. It's something that we think about and talk about constantly and are in conversation with all of our city partners um, to find ways to think of long-term strategies to really address this issue and, and are endlessly grateful to assembly member Friedman and our other electeds for no, I mean, truly for passing numerous uh, bills that are, are really going to make a tangible, profound difference in the way that we push back against uh, gun violence. So again, I'll put my, I'll put my email in the chat. It's not an empty offer. Thank you for that, uh, Seamus. Um, and thank you to everybody for allowing me to participate. Thank you. And Tanya, anything that we didn't ask you that you'd like to comment on or uh, any uh, parting suggestions for those of the, for the three electeds here uh, who are all trying to come up with ways of making our community safer? Uh, I just wanted to thank all of you. I found this incredibly encouraging and it's given me a lot of hope. I am, it's, you know, I, sometimes I'm working at 10,000 feet. To, so just to know that you all are thinking about these things and really working to protect your communities is, is really heartening. And I think it is imperative that we do that at all levels of government because there is no question that we are suffering from a, um, an epidemic of gun violence in this country and it's unacceptable and it's also preventable. So I think there are so many policies, so many 
steps that be, can, can be taken to prevent gun violence. Assembly member, you are certainly leading on a key element of that. I think safe storage of firearms is, an, is a no brainer. Um, it is a way to ensure that our children are safe. It's a way to prevent gun violence and it makes perfect sense. And it doesn't have, you know, it doesn't restrict anybody's ability to own a firearm. So I think it is, you know, I'm so grateful for you for the last three years for really championing this issue. I am very excited about the bills that are being passed this session in Sacramento. They are, again, they're very thoughtful. They are directed and I, they will save lives. So um, I, you know, I'm happy to be an asset as I can to any of you and to provide support as needed, but um, you all are very well positioned to be doing this work. And I'm just incredibly grateful for your voices. Well, thanks. I'm grateful to all of you for participating tonight. And I'm especially grateful that we had so many people watching. Uh, I do hope that it gives, gives people some, something to think about and some actionable items, some thoughts about ways that they can themselves advocate for the change that they would like to see. I think that anybody who's here tonight, I would hope is here because you also share the opinion that what we're seeing in terms of gun violence is completely unacceptable and un-American and not what we want for our kids and for our future. That's certainly my feeling. And I think that it is time that we discuss all of the options that we have. Uh, so I'm really happy to have been able to bring this conversation forward. I learned a lot from everybody. Uh, I truly did, and I think that we will continue the conversation. I do want to mention that I'm also very proud that I, I found out today that one of my personal heroes, Gabby Gifford, who of course was the congresswoman who was terribly wounded in a mass shooting uh, that took the lives of her staff and, and people who were attending an event that she was hosting and who has dedicated herself now to being a gun safety advocate full-time, today received the pr uh, Presidential Medal of Honor. And I think that's very appropriate. And I hope that that means that it's something that the whole nation is going to embrace. And that's making gun safety something that we focus on in a way of life. Uh, because I, I'm not going to accept that we have to live with an ever increasing amount of gun violence, um, mass shootings happening almost on a daily basis in this nation, children finding their parents' guns and, and shooting th their siblings themselves, um, adults, completely preventable and completely unacceptable. So I thank everybody. And, and just like uh, my colleagues, if you have suggestions, please do send them. If you have questions, please do send them. We will try our best to get answers and we'll try our best to run your suggestions up the flagpole and, and see what people think about them. Uh, we think that it's important that our entire community engages in this dialogue. It doesn't stop tonight, it's gonna to keep going. I know that there are activists in the community, not just in Burbank, but all across Los Angeles and all across this nation who wanna stand up and say enough's enough. And it's time that we all pull together, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, somewhere in between, somewhere on the outside, whether you're a gun owner or, not, or someone who's scared of guns, we all should want to be safe and we should all be able to come together on common sense laws to make our community safer. And with that, I want to say to everybody, please be safe, have a wonderful evening, and God bless.